It was the beginning of the 20th century, and two rivals, Robert Scott and Roald Amundsen, set on their expeditions to become the first people in history to reach the South Pole. The race wasn't easy, and it ended tragically for Scott. Amundsen has won and set his tent on the pole before his rivals. A member of Scott's expedition known as Terra Nova, British geologist Thomas Griffith Taylor, not only survived the harsh conditions, but also made an unexpected discovery. He found a waterfall of what appeared to be blood at the rocky base of the glacier, which now has his name, in 1911. It took scientists more than a century to figure out what is behind the eerie coloring. A team of American scientists journeyed to Taylor Glacier with powerful electron microscopes to analyze its contents. Previous studies had scratched the surface of the Crimson Enigma, but no one had previously done a full-scale analysis of its mineralogical makeup. These researchers unleashed a whole arsenal of analytical equipment and spotted little iron-rich nanospheres. These teeny tiny particles, a hundredth the size of human red blood cells, originate from ancient microbes. They flourish abundantly in the meltwaters of Taylor Glacier. These nanospheres are jam-packed with iron, silicon, calcium, aluminum, and sodium, forming a unique composition that paints the subglacial water a vivid shade of red. These nanospheres don't have the usual crystalline structure found in minerals, which is why previous detection methods failed to spot them. Taylor Glacier's icy depths harbor an ancient microbial community that has thrived in isolation for thousands or possibly even millions of years. This discovery could help us in the search for life outside of Earth. Dr. Ken Levy, a research scientist at Johns Hopkins University, has some impressive expertise in planetary materials and the analysis of Martian samples. He decided to find out what would happen if a Mars rover landed in Antarctica. Could it figure out what makes Bloodfalls so mesmerizingly red? So, researchers treated Bloodfalls as a simulated Martian landing site. They used techniques inspired by the rovers exploring the Red Planet. The samples they collected were sent to Johns Hopkins processing facilities. There, Livy unleashed the power of transmission electron microscopy and revealed the enigmatic nanospheres. He made the conclusion that our current methods of analyzing other planets' surfaces with rovers fall short. They can't unravel the true nature of environmental materials, especially on chilly planets like Mars. These materials might be super tiny and non-crystalline, throwing off our detection methods. To truly grasp the essence of rocky planets, we'll need transmission electron microscopes. Strapping one onto a Mars rover isn't feasible yet, but it could mean a start of a new era in space exploration. Have you ever seen a waterfall on fire? Every February, when the stars align just right, Horsetail Fall in Yosemite National Park gets a sensational makeover. As the sun sets, its rays hit the waterfall at the perfect angle, transforming it into a blazing display of vibrant orange and red hues. We don't know exactly who and when discovered this natural miracle. The original valley dwellers may have known about it, but they kept it to themselves. It wasn't until 1973 that photographer Galen Rowell captured the first known photo of the waterfall bringing it into the limelight. Since then, the firefall has become a global sensation, spreading like wildfire on social media and drawing crowds from far and wide. This magnificent cascade draws hundreds of spectators every year, but they can only see the show under certain conditions. First things first, Horsetail Fall needs a flowing stream. If there's not enough snowpack in February, the waterfall won't have enough water to create the magic. The temperatures must be warm enough to melt the snowpack during the day. If it's too chilly, the snow will stay frozen and the fiery spectacle won't ignite. Second, we need a clear western sky at sunset. Those sunbeams need a straight path to hit Horsetail Fall and make it come alive. And since the weather in Yosemite is ever changing, clouds can magically clear up just in time for the show. If all the conditions are just right, you'll witness the Yosemite Firefall in all its glory for about 10 minutes. The mystery of the sailing stones in California's Death Valley National Park has puzzled scientists for years. Heavy stones seem to have a mind of their own and move across racetrack playa, a dried up lake bed. They leave behind a trail on the cracked mud. There were all kinds of theories to explain this phenomenon, 
From magnetic fields or dust devils, which are strong whirlwinds to mischievous pranksters, no one has actually witnessed these rocks in action, which only added to the mystery. In 2006, a NASA scientist named Ralph Lorenz entered the scene. He was studying weather conditions on other planets, but he couldn't resist the allure of Death Valley and those elusive sailing stones. He had an eureka moment while tinkering at his kitchen table with a Tupperware container. Lorenz filled the container with water, leaving a small rock poking out, and chucked it in the freezer. Then he placed this icy construction in a big tray of water with sand at the bottom and gently blew on it. The rock began to glide across the water, leaving a trail in the sand. Lorenz had been studying how ice can make big rocks float and move along tidal beaches in the Arctic Sea. Applying this knowledge, he and his research team figured out that, under certain winter conditions in Death Valley, enough water and ice could form to make the rocks float across racetrack playa in a light breeze. And as they glided, they left their mark in the muddy terrain. The River of Five Colors, Cano Cristales in Colombia, has the unofficial title of the most beautiful river in the world. For most of the year, it looks like any other regular river. The real magic happens between the wet and dry seasons when the water level is just perfect. This unique river floor is lined with a special plant, and when the conditions are right, it bursts into a dazzling display of colors. Think vibrant reds, stunning yellows, and lush greens, all mingling with the blue water. It's like stepping into a living rainbow with a thousand shades in between. This phenomenal display only lasts for a few weeks, from September through November. During Colombia's wet season, the river flows too fast and deep, covering up the river floor and denying the plant the sunlight it needs to turn red. And in the dry season, there's simply not enough water to support the vibrant life in the river. So you have to catch it at just the right time. The reason behind Maldivian beaches glowing in the dark at night isn't a mystery, but it doesn't make them any less impressive. It happens thanks to the bioluminescent plankton. These tiny creatures are like little underwater disco balls, emitting a cool blue glow when they are agitated or on the move. Imagine walking along the shoreline and leaving behind glowing footprints. You can even take a night swim amongst these magical plankton. Researchers have discovered that their bioluminescence is actually a clever defense mechanism against predators. When these microorganisms flash their little blue lights, it disorients and surprises their attackers. The plankton produces this light using a chemical called luciferin. These enchanting plankton can appear at any time of the year. The best chances of seeing them in all their glowing glory are from June to December. During this period, there's a higher volume of plankton in the seas of the Maldives, creating the perfect conditions for a luminous show after the sun sets and the night sky takes over. You'll only witness the magic of bioluminescent plankton when tidal currents bring them close to the shore in large numbers. It's hard to predict exactly when this spectacular show will happen, so make sure to do your research and prepare to take photos with a high ISO to capture it, exactly like it looks in travel catalogs. We've all dreamed of visiting the Arctic and witnessing the natural wonders of polar bears frolicking on ice floes or the aurora borealis dancing across the sky. Well, sorry to break it to you, but you won't find any tourists flocking to Antarctica anytime soon. Why, you may ask? Let's dive into it. First off, where is Antarctica? It's located in the Southern Hemisphere, specifically at the South Pole. The Southern Ocean surrounds it, and most of the continent is covered by ice, making it one of the most remote and frigid places on Earth. Now, have you ever met someone who's visited Antarctica? Probably not. It's one of the least visited places on the planet, and only a handful of lucky explorers have seen its interior, which is mostly made up of glaciers and ice fields. But trust me when I say the wildlife and scenery are out of this world. Why shouldn't you travel to Antarctica? Well, for starters, the environment is incredibly fragile and can be easily damaged. Plus, there are no native human populations on the continent, so your travels would essentially be like visiting an uninhabited island. And let's not forget that it's also one of the most expensive destinations to travel to. Despite all that, Antarctica is not exactly guarded like a fortress. 
But there is an international agreement called the Antarctic Treaty. This treaty was negotiated to prevent any unwanted activity on the continent and bans some forms of testing done there by member states. But the primary reason we can't just waltz into Antarctica is that it has a delicate ecosystem that needs protection. The treaty states that Antarctica should be used for peaceful purposes only and should be free from any human activity that could harm the environment. Scientists are still learning about the continent's unique ecosystem, and our activity and machines could disrupt the delicate balance that exists there. If you're still itching to go to Antarctica, getting permission isn't exactly a walk in the park. U.S. citizens, for example, need to complete a special form and send it to the Office of Ocean and Polar Affairs. And once you're there, you'll need to follow some strict guidelines to protect the environment, like not disturbing any wildlife or taking souvenirs like rocks, plants, or animals. Now, technically, can you live in Antarctica? While there are no laws banning people from living there permanently, it's a very inhospitable environment and unsuitable for human habitation. Temperatures can reach negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit and below, making it nearly impossible for anyone to survive without the proper equipment and experience. Plus, the nearest piece of land is over 1,000 miles away, making any inhabitants completely cut off from the rest of the world. Who knows, maybe one day we'll get the chance to visit this unique and fascinating continent. But until then, let's admire it from afar. Let's now talk a bit about the discovery of Antarctica. Unlike other places that were already inhabited, Antarctica never had a native human population. Ancient Greek philosophers had an idea about the continent and called it Antarktos, meaning opposite the bear. The bears it refers to are not the polar ones though, but rather the great and little bear constellations, which are only observable in the Northern Hemisphere. As a result, the term signifies the opposite of the land of the bear. Whaling and sealing voyages in the late 1700s and early 1800s would venture further south when rounding Cape Horn at the tip of South America. It was known that going further south often meant stronger winds, but also the risk of hitting floating ice of all sizes and of winds and seas that could prove dangerous to the ship and crew. Captain James Cook was the first to cross the Antarctic Circle on January 17, 1773, in the Ross Sea region. He reached a point further north a year later, and though he didn't sight land, he came to within 50 miles and saw deposits of rock held in icebergs, indicating that a more southerly land existed. The first sighting of Antarctica is widely acknowledged to have taken place in January of 1820 during the voyage of two ships under the command of Captain Fabian Gottlieb von Bellingshausen as part of a two-year exploratory expedition around the world to discover new lands. The captain's ships were the first to have crossed the Antarctic Circle since Cook. The first undisputed landing on Antarctica didn't happen until much later, on January 24, 1895, at Cape Adare during the whaling voyage of the ship Antarctic led by Henrik Bull. A small boat with six or possibly seven men on board rowed ashore during calm conditions. You might not believe it, but Antarctica is actually a desert. With all that ice, you'd think it'd be like a winter wonderland with snowball fights and hot cocoa all day long. When we think of deserts, we picture camels and cacti and people struggling to find water. But in Antarctica, it's a whole different story. The struggle isn't to find water, it's to find anything that's not covered in ice. And the average rainfall has been just over 0.4 inches in the past 30 years. That's like a few drops of rain compared to what we're used to. So technically, it's not the dunes or sizzling heat that makes a desert, well, a desert. It's the lack of precipitation. But don't worry, if you ever find yourself lost in Antarctica, you won't have to worry about getting thirsty. Just make sure you bring a jacket and some mittens because it's cold enough to make you into a popsicle. Not only is Antarctica one of the driest places on Earth, but it's also the coldest, the windiest, and the highest. <laughs> Talk about overachieving. The penguins and scientists down in Antarctica 
have at times found themselves in a bit of a pickle when it comes to time. You see, unlike the rest of us on this big blue planet, there is no Antarctica time zone. All the lines of longitude meet at a single point at the South Pole, making it a bit of a head-scratcher when trying to figure out what time it is. Now, you might be thinking, but how do the scientists and researchers keep track of time down there? Good question. They typically stick to the time zone of the country they departed from. However, with stations from all over the world on the Antarctic Peninsula, things can get a little wacky. Imagine trying to coordinate with your neighboring countries without accidentally waking them up in the middle of the night. You might think that not much could survive in a place where the temperature is extremely cold, the sun barely shows up, and the wind could blow you away faster than a tumbleweed. Well, as in many places on Earth, life found a way in Antarctica, too. Believe it or not, this frozen continent is buzzing with activity. It's home to billions of krill, which in turn attract lots of seals and more penguins than you can shake a fish at. But don't let their cute and cuddly appearance fool you. Penguins are the ultimate swimmers, with streamlined bodies that would make Olympic medal winners jealous. They come ashore to breed and chill, but their real talent is stealing pebbles from each other and forming mathematically precise huddles to stay warm. Antarctica is also home to the largest species of penguin on Earth. It's called the emperor penguin. Sure, these creatures are flightless birds, but that doesn't mean they can't jump. In fact, some of them can leap up to 120 inches. And let's not forget about the seals. With their furry bodies and special songs, these marine mammals are protected by the Antarctic Treaty, and they're thriving in the cool waters of the Southern Ocean, too. But the real stars of the show are the whales. During the Antarctic summer, these huge creatures show up in droves to chow down on the abundant krill. It's indeed like a whale buffet down there. Do you know that NASA explores not only stars, planets, galaxies, or black holes? Hard to believe, but yes. The agency also works on discoveries here on our home planet Earth. So what has NASA recently discovered? Is there life under the ice? While they were analyzing data recently, they discovered something unbelievable hiding under Antarctica's ice. And this discovery not only changes everything we know about the whole water system of the Earth, but it may also help with research about life in space. Humankind's existence might depend on understanding Antarctica and its secrets. So, the recent discoveries reveal vital information about our survival. But before we continue, let's see how much you know about this place, where it's only ice as far as your eyes can see. Antarctica is one of the world's seven continents in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the fifth largest continent in terms of total area, and that means it's almost twice the size of Australia. Want to see real meteorites? Go to Antarctica! Due to its dry climate, Antarctica is one of the best places to observe space. But what's even greater is that you can find meteorites on the white surface of the continent. Scientists have already plucked about 45,000 meteorites from the ice, and they think they can see another 300,000. Since there aren't many terrestrial rocks there, it's easy for them to spot them thanks to their dark color. Antarctica's dry desert environment also helps preserve them, even the ones that fell to Earth more than one million years ago. And can you imagine any volcanic activity in Antarctica? It's hard. But this place is where fire meets the ice. West Antarctica is where most volcanic activity occurs. Scientists recently found that 138 volcanoes exist in West Antarctica alone. Wow! You would think that Antarctica is always cold, but no. Its coastal regions can get as warm as 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But have you ever wondered what Antarctica would look like if there were no ice? It may seem unimaginable now, but it was not always covered by ice. That was 34 million years ago, though, so nobody could tell how the continent's surface would be without the ice. But NASA changed that. They generated computer simulations and created the most accurate map of it as of today. What they saw was incredible. 
the continent was not flat at all like it seemed. It's pretty bumpy with valleys, rolling plains, and high mountains. But this was nothing next to what they had discovered under Antarctica's ice. So what is it? Drum roll, please. NASA found two new subglacial lakes. And what's even cooler about it is that they spotted these lakes from space. How is that? If your answer is high-tech satellites, then you're right. In 2003, NASA launched a satellite called IceSat. It measured ice sheet mass balance and cloud and aerosol heights. The satellite also helped create the ice-free map of Antarctica. In 2010, the European Space Agency launched the second satellite, Cryosat-2. It was for tracking the changes in the thickness of the ice. Then, in 2018, NASA launched the third one, IceSat-2, a follow-on to the IceSat spacecraft. It measured ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness. It was NASA's most advanced Earth-observing laser instrument. It delivered the highest precision data. And when that was combined with the data from the other satellites, it was possible to spot these two new lakes near a pair of larger ones. But how is it possible that these lakes exist in the first place? The average thickness of most Antarctica ice is approximately 1.2 miles. However, it can get over 1.8 miles thick in some places, especially during the winter. So you might think that there's nothing under there, but science says otherwise. It's not quite possible to see it with your bare eyes, but the continent's ice is slowly but constantly flowing in different directions under the force of its weight. But scientists could not figure out how water moved for many years. That started to change in 2007, when data gathered from the ice sat provided insight into what hides beneath the surface. They first discovered an entire network of meltwater lakes connected under Antarctica's fast-flowing ice streams, and there were hundreds of them. Scripps Institution of Oceanography glaciologist Helen Amanda Fricker figured that the elevation changes measured by IceSat happened because of the dynamics of these lakes. They did not hold meltwater statically. Instead, they were filling and draining continuously over time through a system of waterways. And as they did that, the ice above rose and fell. But where do they drain? The ocean, of course, and it drains a lot. A recent study, co-authored by Fricker, found that the drainage of one lake flushed as much as 198 billion gallons into the ocean in only three days. Countless mysteries about how nature works are still waiting to be solved. But finding the two new lakes will give scientists a better picture of how fast the Antarctic ice sheet will change as the climate gets warmer and how this will affect global ocean currents and sea level rise. The filling and draining cycle of the lakes also caused the ice sheet to suffer cracks and crevices. So, the information they find from these new lakes will also give them a better understanding of the damage on the surface of the ice. They will also be able to assess how this filling and draining system influences the speed at which ice slips into the oceans and seas. And that means they can evaluate how the added freshwater may alter marine ecosystems. This discovery may also suggest whether life is under the ice. Wow! Scientists drilled through about 3,504 feet of ice and found that water samples taken from one of the lakes contained approximately 10,000 bacterial cells per milliliter. Such a high number of bacterial life is a good sign because that means the icy waters might also support higher life forms, such as microanimals, and one of these new lakes might even be their home. But the most exciting thing is that the new lakes might help them understand whether life on other planets is possible. Scientists believe any life below the frozen surface of the planet Mars might follow the patterns seen in Antarctica's lakes. So, there is a possibility that they might find critical new information on the type of life that may have existed on the red planet. You wouldn't want to be there during the winter, though. The lowest temperature on Earth you can experience is negative 128 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2010, 
there was an even lower temperature of negative 135 degrees Fahrenheit. And you may feel this cold much worse due to the strong and dry winds. Did you know that the size of the ice surface on Antarctica also changes throughout the year? It's about 1.2 million square miles during the summer, but when it's winter, it grows to 7.3 million square miles. Yet, despite the change, it remains the largest piece of ice on Earth. Sorry, Arctic, you lose. Do you know these cute little penguins? Consider these animals the locals, because there is no native population in Antarctica. It's a no-man's land, because no single country owns it. But do you know who really owns it? Five different species of penguins, seals, and killer whales. Ha ha. Despite the continent's harsh conditions, you can visit it as a tourist for fishing and research purposes. Around 5,000 people reside on the continent during summer at research stations. But when winter comes, the number naturally drops down to 1,000. Antarctica. Your geography teacher must have told you there are seven continents in the world. In 2017, scientists made an announcement that changed this universal truth, the discovery of Zealandia. They called for a change in world maps and provided us with some proof, of course. First off, let's take a look at the ocean floor near New Zealand. The continental shelves of this mysterious continent are chilling at a depth of around 3,280 feet below sea level. The nearby oceanic crust dives even deeper at 9,800 feet below that. All of that is giving us those continent vibes, with varying altitudes from deep below the ocean to the majestic Mount Cook, standing tall at 12,217 feet above sea level. Brave geologists have gone deep down to collect rocks from the ocean floor. They found that unlike the nearby oceanic crust, which is made up of fresh basaltic rocks, the crust around New Zealand is one impressive mix. We're talking granite, limestone, sandstone, and some ancient rock types that are incredibly ancient. All this screams continental crust. Finally, scientists have discovered a narrow strip of oceanic crust that separates Australia from the hidden land of Zealandia. It means these two are separate continents. 85 million years ago, Zealandia decided to break free from the supercontinent Gondwana. Millions of years later, the Earth's tectonic plates, those puzzle pieces that make up our planet's crust, started throwing a wild party. The mighty Pacific Plate, the heavyweight champion of tectonic plates, decided to take a dive beneath Zealandia's continental crust. This process is called subduction. As a result, the root of Zealandia, that connection to its continental crust, broke off and went into the depths below. So you see now that it takes millions of years and a lot of action for a new continent to form. But what if the impossible happened? and a new continent formed overnight in the Pacific Ocean. The next morning, you'd probably spill your morning coffee while watching the news. For this newfound land to be considered a full-fledged continent, it needs to have a surface area like Zealandia and be a large, uninterrupted chunk of land with some water surrounding it. And here comes the twist. The Pacific Ocean has an average depth of 13,000 feet. So, if a continent wanted to join the party, it would have to push a whole lot of rock upward, shaping its way to the surface. A new continent emerging overnight would make sea levels skyrocket. We'd have to say goodbye to geographically low-lying countries like Bangladesh, Senegal, and the Netherlands. The ocean currents would be in for a wild ride too. The North Pacific subtropical gyre a vibrant hotspot for marine life would be thrown off balance. Those poor marine creatures who rely on the currents for their journeys would need some new source of navigation. Plus, the creatures that live permanently in one place could lose their main food source. Oceans are like global free-for-alls, but with a new continent in play, the countries situated nearby would be willing to stake their claim on this unexpected landmass. This new continent would be a blank canvas. No lush landscapes or freshwater sources, just rock and more rock. So if you are dreaming of relocating to this novelty, you have to wait for some serious terraforming to make it habitable. 
But for now, let's go back to the real new continent of Zealandia. It's actually a microcontinent, which is an official word for a landmass that has separated from a main continent. In our case, it was Antarctica and then Australia. You could say Zealandia is a bit shy, with only up to 7% of its size peaking above the water surface. But it's nearly 70% as large as Australia in total and proudly boasts of two major islands we know and love as New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island. Plus, there are many smaller islets. The largest islands have glaciers, like the famous Tasman Glacier on the South Island. Thanks to some glacial action in the past, Zealandia can show off its fjords and valleys. New Caledonia has a tropical vibe with its Oceania and South Pacific connections. The unofficial eighth continent is a hot spot for geological action. Part of it belongs to the Australian plate, while the rest rides the Pacific plate. It has six major areas with active volcanoes. And don't forget the geothermal treats, geysers and hot springs are scattered all over the place courtesy of the Australian and Pacific plates having a steamy interaction. The underwater world of Zealandia is a treasure chest of mineral deposits and natural gas fields. It's also a scientific playground. During those icy glacial periods, sea levels dropped and more of Zealandia emerged from the depths. The fossils this process left behind are like an encyclopedia of valuable clues about the life that thrived here during ancient times. The search for Zealandia lasted for 375 years. It all started in 1642, when Dutch seafarer and explorer Abel Tasman set on a mission from Jakarta, Indonesia. Back in the day, Europeans were sure that there had to be a massive land down under to balance out their own continent up north. They even had a fancy name for it, Terra Australis. Tasman was determined to become the first to find it, he went west, then south, then east, all the way to the South Island of New Zealand. But here's where things took a turn for the worst. The local Maori people, who had been living there for centuries, didn't exactly roll out the red carpet. They rammed one of Tasman's small boats, and sadly, four of the Europeans met their ends. What happened next remains a mystery. But a few weeks later, Tasman sailed back home without ever stepping foot on this mysterious land he believed to be the great southern continent. He never came back. The explorer didn't even realize that he was actually right all along about the existence of a missing continent. And you already know it only became official in 2017. Another lost and found continent isn't hiding in the ocean, but under Europe. It's called the Greater Adria and it collided with Europe and started to sink under it around 140 million years ago. Today, it lies beneath Italy, Greece, and the Baltics. Its size and even shape match that of Greenland, the world's largest island. Greater Adria is no longer visible, but it left some clues. Parts of it were embedded in the Alps. Other chucks were incorporated into present-day Italy and Croatia on the other side of the Adriatic Sea. Limestone rocks from the former continent started to change once they were under the European landmass. Tremendous heat and pressure spread over tens of millions of years changed their structure. Out goes the limestone, in comes the marble. All the Greek and Roman temples you admired on your summer vacation were constructed using this marble. It was sort of a going away gift from a long lost continent. You don't notice this, but our planet never stops moving, and it happens deep beneath our feet. 120 million years ago, Australia and Antarctica were a single piece of land. They went their separate ways, but Antarctica didn't leave empty-handed. Today, there is an oceanic plateau in the Indian Ocean. Long ago, it was connected to another lost continent, the Kerguelen microcontinent. Scientists believe that it made a land bridge between India and Antarctica. To find out what it was like, we can look at a tiny archipelago in the southern Indian Ocean. These islands are all that is left of the ancient landmass. They have a cold climate and feature glaciers because they're so close to Antarctica. But in the past, the climate must have been temperate with plenty of rainfall. The animals and plants would have been similar to those that we find in tropical regions today. 
the lost continent landscape was probably much like that of New Zealand. Our planet keeps changing, and at some point, all the continents will reconnect with each other, forming one supercontinent again. And maybe then, future humans will wonder, what if our continent broke into pieces tomorrow? There's not much to do in Antarctica except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples. But because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. 
And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling, even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. 